Hello and welcome back. This is now part two of the home version of Contending Perspectives in Economics. Uh, let's see. Oh, A, I've put the same shirt on to make you think it's still the same day. It was actually yesterday that I did the other one. Um, and B, this is going to be study question number 67. Uh, give the monetarist explanation of inflation that includes MV equals PY. Don't mind if I do. Now, uh, let's see. First thing is, I guess, some in terms of some general background. So up to now, we've done like labor market and uh, the S equals I GDP thing. And, and again, the post-Keynesian view was described as a reaction to the neoclassical view. In other words, the neoclassicals are saying something, one, one thing rather, and the post-Keynesians slash Keynes were saying, no, 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 that's not the way it works. It works this way instead. Well, this part of the lecture is very similar. Uh, except this is a reaction to a neoclassical view of how inflation takes place. All right. So before it was about unemployment and GDP. This time it's about inflation. And so the post Keynesians are going to take issue with the idea that printing money creates uh, inflation. And in order to do that, I have to introduce something called the um, uh, equation of exchange, which you may have seen in another class. If so, you're about to see it again. Now, uh, this part of the video or the lecture, if you will, uh, I'm going to try something I haven't tried before, and that is doing a screen cap of a PowerPoint that I had done for a talk I gave. Right, so I, I give a um, probably a more interesting explanation of how MV equals PY works in that PowerPoint. So I want to show you that I've never done that before. So I'm going to try to like you know show the uh, show the PowerPoint and then cap it. Uh, and then I don't know how, uh, when I put my narration in, but anyway, so, however, before I do that, let me go ahead and just give you the answer to this question. So I'm going to do this one as I'll give you the answer first and then I'll explain it second. So here we go. Let's see. Number 67. Okay. Give the monetarist explanation of inflation that includes MV equals PY. The, is it, they believe that inflation is caused by. Excuse me, I'm, my knee might hit the TV tray that the uh, computer's on. All right. They believe that inflation is caused by. Quote. Too much money chasing too few goods. Again, this is the monitor's explanation. It's not the post Keynesian one. That's going to come second. All right, the core relationship in monetarism is. MV equals PY. Uh, and monetarism is a branch of neoclassicism, right? I guess I, I didn't point that out. Okay, I'm going to wait for a moment for you to get all that written down. I am hoping that it is not too glary. I can't tell here. Uh, I think it's okay. Anyway, I'll give you a second to write that down. Then I got to erase it and, and write the next one. Da -da -da. Oh, Tennessee, you got it. Oh, well, uh, they uh, had a, a fortune on their side the last two weeks, and now not this week. And, okay. And, of course, we won't talk about the Rangers at all. Uh, given that they believe that V... this in over here that V is constant due to behavioral factors
and uh, and that y is stable and that y is stable at the full employment or natural level. Uh, if the government raises M I have to wait wait for you to finish writing that down so I can erase the whole thing again again I apologize for the fact that we do not have a TCU like board in our home we actually did at one point but Meg took it with her uh, back to school so uh, that's where she can do her thinking her theorizing and so forth on her uh, big marker board uh, let's see so if the and the next word is going to be government. And I shall now assume that you are caught up. Government. Raises money supply above agents demand for money. Raises money supply above agents demand for money, comma, those agents will try to rid themselves those agents will try to rid themselves of and I believe it says excess money balances. No, uh, of excess cash through spending. I think it's a period now. Yes. But there is no more stuff. So wait again. All right, cup of tea. Made the only civilized way with milk and sugar. I'll read it out. Government raises money supply above agents' demand for money. Those agents will try to rid themselves of excess cash through spending. But there is no more. But there is no more stuff. That is Y or output now than there was before. So people can't buy more. Good. Yes. And last sentence coming up. Instead, they just bid prices. Oh, bid up. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Two, two more sentences. Instead, they just bid up prices. And last sentence, which kind of sums things up. Therefore, hope I got room. Let's see. I might, I might. Therefore, comma,
delta M leads to delta P or change in money supply leads to change in price. And inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Let's see, there's no more stuff that is why now than there was before, so people can't buy more. Instead, they just bid up prices, period. Therefore, the change in the money supply leads to a change in prices, and inflation is always and everywhere in monetary phenomena. Okay, so you might not know uh, why, but there's a couple of expressions I used in there that I didn't need to accept that that's exactly the way the monetarists word things, and so I wanted you to be able to, sens to be sensitive to that, so that if you were to ever see, for example, in an article, uh, someone saying that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Well, that's a dead giveaway. That, 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 that's a phrase that they use to explain how inflation works. And so let me just tell you briefly what that just said, and then I will try to do the screen cap thing and do the um, uh, PowerPoint that, that explains this. What it basically said was that if the government gives people more cash than they want, you know, you, you want a certain amount of cash uh, as savings, you know, in case there's a, a good or a bad um, opportunity in the future. And let's say the government gave you more money than you wanted. They started printing money, right? Uh, then what do you do with cash you don't want? You spend it. So these people go out to try to spend the money, except that this model already assumed we were at full employment. We already were selling, I'm sorry, producing all we could possibly produce. So that when you go out to Target and Walmart to buy more, there isn't any more. So all you do is end up competing with all the other shoppers who are also trying to get rid of their excess cash and all you do is bid up the prices of goods and services. So what did the printing of the money accomplish? It simply printed inflation. And that is this part of the story. So I will now sign off here and see if I can figure out how to do the other part. May the force be with you. Okay, well this is attempt number, well, in a sense number two, and in another way, number 564 of trying to figure out how to do a screenshot video of my computer so that I can show you this uh, presentation I made which was related to the MV equals PY that I just showed you on the study question. Hopefully this will work out. I went through the whole thing last time and then when I went to save it uh, uh, had an error and then when I looked it up online it said oh yeah it, it can't save anything bigger than you know X which they don't tell you until when you try to save it uh, it um, has the error. But you know what? That's my problem. That's not yours. So this is, as I said, a, a, a talk that I gave at the Rotary Club of Colleyville, a place where I'm very popular because I'm absolutely free. Uh, and, and also a friend of mine is, is an officer there. And so this was about, uh, there have been all these warnings that there's going to be terrible hyperinflation since the financial crisis, or, or rather since the Federal Reserve's very accommodative, uh, stimulative monetary policy since the financial crisis. And they thought, well, they're printing all this money, it's going to cause all kinds of terrible inflation. Well, this turns out to be directly related to the MV equals PY I was just talking about. And so I thought this might be a good way of explaining uh, the underlying logic of that particular theory. So here we go. First, I wanted to show the people in the audience that this is something that's been been talked about for a while now and this was very easy to look up all I had to do was look up hyperinflation and then you know plug in on the on the search tools to say I want something from 2010 I want something from 2011 and so forth so here's somebody saying not 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 will it happen but how in hyperinflation is going to happen in America back in 2010 well it didn't happen but that's okay in 2011 whoever this person is put out special commentary number 357, which is what this person says to make themselves feel important since this was typed in their parents' basement. Um, but this is, you know, it's going to happen any day now. The United States nears hyperinflationary Great Depression, you know, and on and on there. No, it, it's, it's horrifying. But it didn't happen. But that's okay. It's going to happen in 2012. And as it says here, look down the bottom uh, in, the, in the center there. Hyperinflation is virtually assured because the Fed doesn't have any options left. Note that the web page also points out how to buy gold and silver, which suggests that the person who runs this web page is actually making their money by selling advertising and not because they really know what's going to happen. Oh, oh and I also like the little uh, sub headline under USA Watchdog. 
analyzing the news to give you a clear picture of what's really going on. Well, I had to subscribe to this webpage, I guess, because I want to know what's really going on. 2013. I know it hasn't happened yet, but it's just around the corner. This one embarrasses me a bit, to tell you the truth, because it's actually by an economist. 2014. I know it didn't happen in 2010. I know it didn't happen in 2011 or 2012 or 2013, but an expert has warned of hyperinflation. The American way of life will be destroyed. And of course it was. Oh no, wait, that's right. It wasn't. Um, but that's okay. 2015. Hyperinflation to start in 2015. Economist says get supplies, gold, silver, canned goods, toilet paper, bottled water. That wasn't me that said that, by the way. Uh, oh, hey, you know what I just noticed? On the bottom left down there where it says MacSlavo, S-H-T-F plan.com. That was one of the earlier web, uh, earlier web pages. Oh, it's this one right here. The S-H-T-F plan.com. Well, I'll be darned. Okay, so, and you can find lots of these things. Uh, tons of them saying it's going to happen any day now. Well, you know, I make fun of these people here, but of course there was terrible hyper hyperinflation since the financial crisis. In fact, let's have a look at the data. In the 1970s, the average rate of inflation was 7.1% per year. In the 1980s, it was 5.6% per year. 1990s, 3.0%. And then 2000s up to the financial crisis, 2.8%. But then look at the massive rate of inflation since the financial crisis in 2008. Oh, oh, that's true. It's, it's a lot smaller than all the other numbers. And, and that, that's the problem. I mean, this, this whole hyperinflation thing, not only was there no hyperinflation, which there's really no technical term for that, or no technical definition, rather, for what hyperinflation is, but it's sure not 1.7. Uh, and if, and if 7.1 wasn't hyperinflation, then we're a long way away from that. I also, as you can see underneath there, broke it down by year with QEs next to the years when the Fed was undertaking quantitative easing operations. Well, question one, why did people expect inflation? And question two, why didn't it happen? Oh, I should be hitting the little key here on the keyboard a little quieter, shouldn't I? I'm terribly sorry. Now, here's that Einstein guy that we've all heard so much about. Whether you can observe a thing or not depends on the theory which you use, which, of course, we've talked about in class. Uh, the particular way you are interpreting the world and which variables you believe are most important are going to define what you notice in the world and what you assume about the various interactions. So, the next question I want to answer here is, well, what exact theory were these hyperinflation warnings coming from? And it was the quantity theory of money, the MV equals PY that I just showed you in the study question uh, for you moments ago, for me hours ago, since I've been spending all this time trying to get this darn software to work. So, here's the MV equals PY again, and I didn't explain it, well, a very little before, and, and, and so let, let me go into a little bit more detail now. M is the supply of money, or as it says down below the little uh, diagram there, number of dollar bills. Think of it as the number, let's say we don't have electronic money, we only have printed money. It's the number of printed dollar bills in circulation in the United States. The velocity is the number of times each one of those dollar bills tends to be used on average. So, for example, if there were a thousand one dollar bills and on average each one got used five times, then over the course of whatever time period we're talking about here, let's say it's a year, there must have been five thousand dollars worth of transactions. One thousand dollars used an average of five times. Well, that five thousand dollars worth of transactions on the left must be equal to the dollar value of all the stuff that was purchased on the right. And the Y is the number of things that were purchased and the P is the average price level of each one. So those two have to add up to the same number, and in fact, there is no controversy among economists about this equation so far. Uh, in fact, you see the three equal signs there? Uh, you probably already know this because you're uh, advanced uh, scholarly people, unlike some of the people I give talks to. They want to know why there are three equal signs. Well, it's because it's an identity. I mean, this, this is not, um, uh, this is like saying batting average is equal to the number of hits divided by at-bats. Well, of course it is. That's how we defined it. So, now an example. Let's say that the money supply is 100 and that each dollar bill gets used an average of three times. Then M times V, or the dollar value of all the transactions, must be $300. So therefore, the money spent on all the goods and services is also $300. And if there were 50 of those goods and services, as you see under Y, then the average price must have been $6 each item. 
five or, you know, 50 times six is the same thing as 100 times three. Or let's jump down to the next you know, uh, row down here. With the same money supply and velocity, but with 200 things being purchased, the average price level must have been $1.50 each. All right, so that's how MV equals PY is supposed to work. Now, let me show you what happens if we start increasing the money supply. And, and let me point out two things here. The, the, uh, first of all, notice I never changed the V. That's because in the study question I gave you earlier, the assumption under the monetarist model was that velocity is constant. So that's what, I'm, that's what I'm doing here. I'm trying to give their view of the way MV equals PY works. And why they think velocity is constant is because they believe that it's linked to people's habits and the structure of the financial institutions, neither, neither of which changes very quickly. For example, let's say that it took a year after you wrote a check for the check to clear. Well, now the velocity of money is going to be very low. You know, after you spent $100 at Target, it's going to be a year before Target, before the, you know, the check actually clears and Target can use that money. As opposed to the way it really works, where it's, it's cleared, you know, almost instantaneously and Target can use the money almost right away. Uh, so as the technology in the financial industry becomes more advanced, so the velocity of money might be expected to increase. So this is, you know, this is the idea that the technology doesn't change that quickly. So therefore, let's just assume velocity is constant. A little bit more to it than that, but that's a good explanation uh, for now. It's all you need for this class. Now, under Y, you see I've left it at 200 the whole time. And this, too, is from a monetarist assumption that we are already at full employment. All right, uh, That was also in the study question that I went over. And note how this is consistent with the entire neoclassical approach, you know, at monetarism being a part of neoclassicism, that the economy automatically tends towards full employment, so let's just assume they're there already and do our analysis from there. So we're already producing as much as we could possibly produce, 200. Now, of course, that would grow over time, but let's just keep it you know, simple right now. We're at 200, velocity is three. What happens if you start increasing the money supply? And you know, the answer is pretty obvious. Uh, in the first row there, 300 is N times V. And if we have 200 things, then the average price must have been a buck 50 each. If we double the money supply, what happens under the price column? It doubles. And if we increase the money supply by another 50% from 200 to 300, then no surprise, prices increase from 3 to 4.5, uh, which is going to be another 50% you know, increase. So what that means is then that you know, here are their three premises. Right? The first one is that M times V equals P times Y. And as I said, nobody really disagrees with that. Premise number two, V is stable. And not everyone agrees with that. But this is what we're going with here in the monetarist view. Premise number three, Y is constant. Uh, and if, if this were perspectives in macro where we do this in much more detail, I would actually do these things all in growth rates, the growth rate of money supply, the growth rate of velocity, and so forth. So, uh, but here, we're just going to do it as a level. Y is it constant at a particular level? Uh, what did I do? 200? Yeah, for example, 200. Okay. Therefore, I mean, look at that. Look at the equation in, in premise one. M times V equals P times Y. If V cannot change and Y cannot change, then whatever happens with M is going to happen to P. If M doubles, P doubles. If M falls by, you know, if, v, if M is halved, P is halved. So what did they think happened during the financial crisis? They thought that the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I guess I should back up and finish that off then. So why did they expect inflation? Because the money supply went up. The money supply went up a lot. So they therefore expected how much inflation? A lot. Well, why didn't it happen? Well, you know, that, that's obviously a point of contention, uh, but uh, the post-Keynesians, for example, would say, well, look, premises two and three are wrong. Premise two, velocity is stable. Actually, velocity tends to fall in recessions. People spend money less quickly in recessions. They hold on to it. They're scared. They hold on to the money. Just like we said the other day with the uncertainty, the fundamental uncertainty, people are worried about the future. Not only do they save, but they'll hold on to cash because they're worried. So, and indeed, Federal Reserve studies have shown that the, that the velocity of money collapsed after the financial crisis as people held on to cash. Second, why was not constant. After the financial crisis was, you know, the, the recession associated with it had ended, then the economy did grow, all right? So why did go up and, and by quite a bit. So I, in this example, I give you an example down here to show, hey, it's possible for the money supply to triple and yet have no change in the price level whatsoever. Now, I just made up these numbers as an example for the people in the Colleyville Rotary Club. I do not claim these to be proportional to what really happened, 
But the idea is that if we have a fall in velocity, which we would expect after something like, you know, like the financial crisis, and if output recovers from the low level that it would have reached during the financial crisis, then it's possible here with the numbers I've made up for the money supply to triple and yet prices actually stay exactly the same. But the goal here was not so much to show you that, was to show you how MV uh, equals PY works. And uh, I thought it would be easier to see how it worked with a specific example like this. And I believe, yeah, yeah, that's a, I may do some of this other stuff here later. Uh, I'm gonna see how much time all this took. I figured I'd give you about an hour's worth of lecture. Uh, and I did about 30 minutes on the first one. So let me sign off for now. And uh, hopefully this software actually worked. I'll find out in just a second. Au revoir.